major sponsors for Ableton on Air include Green Mountain Support Services of Vermont, Washington County Mental Health, Alaa Israel. Food sponsors for Ableton on Air include Geffen Foods Israel, Osem Foods Israel. Major media sponsors for Ableton on Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International. Hello, welcome to this edition of Ableton on Air, the one and only program that focuses on the needs, concerns, and achievements of the differently able. I'm your host, Lauren Seiler, and Arlene happens to be on the phone. Hi, Arlene. Hello, Mr. Seiler. Okay. Uh, we both... Um, uh, we both host and produce Ableton on Air, and we would like to thank our sponsors, uh, Green Mountain Support Services, Washington County Mental Health, Allah Israel, and many others uh, for being a part of Ableton on Air and sponsoring our show. Uh, with us today, we would like to uh, say uh, a big um, Vermont, well, uh, New England hello to... Uh, William C. Jackson, freelance reporter for um, the for the Harlem Times. Hi, William. How you doing? Hi, I'm good. How about you? Good, good. Nice to um, have you join us on the show. Before we get to you, though, we just want to say um, this is a small little coronavirus update. Um, all of California is basically shut down, mostly. Um, Florida is basically shut down. Uh, Vermont, uh, by the way, uh, is very little cases. We only have 56 deaths, so we're flattening the curve. Um, how is it um, in Connecticut, William, with coronavirus? Well, uh, like, I, like I explained before, uh, you know, we had a couple of days where we had no deaths reported. Mm. But... Uh, you know, um, I think we're starting to find the curve out here, too. What they're doing with um, New Jersey, Connecticut, and New York is that, you know, they're requiring uh, people who travel from other states to quarantine for 14 days mm. if they come from highly affected um, areas of the country. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, but um, basically some big, huge places... Uh, open back up too soon, but you know. Well, yes. Well, yes. Some places have opened back up too soon. Um, you know, mm -hmm. they're seeing spikes in cases, and you know, um, unfortunately, there have been deaths have, um, attributed to that. Um, but you know, um, you know, th there were some states that were in phases. I know California was in. Um, Phase, uh, I think it was in phase two, I think, but they're going back to phase one. And I know here in Connecticut, we were supposed to start phase three, but the governor, Dad Lamont, mm -hmm. uh, he said he would put a hold on starting phase three out of an abundance of caution. Now, what's, so, what's phase one, two, and three in this case? Well, uh, I think stage... Um, what, can you repeat that? I'm sorry, I didn't mean it, to... Um, um, it's okay. Uh, what's phase one, two, and three in this case? Like, okay, what's phase three? Well, phase three, I think they was going to start um, opening up restaurants and stuff to allow, and um, certain other spaces to allow, um, you know, a minimal amount of people inside, but at least 100 outside, mm -hmm. all right? A mm. hundred outside the dining situation. Mm -hmm. But like I said, but like I said, um, they put a they put um they put a pause on phase three out of abundance of caution, just to make sure that there are no other case no um spike in cases. So mm -hmm. you know, I think um the um phase three was supposed to start later this. Month, mm -hmm. but but um probably won't start until like maybe next month at at best. So 
Okay, um, uh, let's get to your reporting. Um, Arlene, you still yeah. there? Yeah, I'm here. Okay. Um, okay, so let's get started. So you're, you're a freelance reporter with uh, the Harlem Times. <clears throat> and uh, can you explain to us, well, being the fact, despite your challenges of, of uh, if it's okay if I can say, um, <clears throat> you deal with mental challenges, right? So despite your challenges, how have you persevered in becoming a reporter? Let's start there. major depression with um, psychotic features. Okay. okay. That is my di that is my mental diagnosis. Mm -hmm. So um you know um I've been seeking treatment for this since April of two thousand seven. And um I remember certainly the first time I went to seek treatment. Um I wasn't in Connecticut at the time. I was still living in New York City. I was about to graduate from college. Um, uh, I went there because I actually, the day I went to the, uh, the day I went to seek help for the first time, I was um, going to go to the City University of New York's job fair. And, uh, you know, I was dressed in a suit and tie. Mm -hmm. And um, it just so happened that one of the patients that was uh, there, he thought I was one of the staff because I was dressed up in a suit and a tie. So, mm -hmm. you know, you know, so, um, you know, I explained to my um, psychiatrist at the time because I was living in the Bronx, um, you know, um, what my situation was and, you know, you know, that I was in college and stuff like that. And, um, you know, she, I think one of the questions she asked me was um, up as part of, I guess, um, the, the discussion I had with, um, with um, college was, she asked me what my GPA was. Mm -hmm. And I explained to my, I explained to her it was about 2.5, okay? Mm -hmm. And she said that was a good GPA for somebody who's going through what I'm going through, basically. Mm -hmm. You know? So, um... What was your you GPA, know? if you don't mind me asking, uh, backtrack, when you went to, no, um, you're, uh, you're an alumnus of Sacred Heart University. Um, yeah. What was your GPA there uh, with your first master's, because I understand you're going for your second master's, which is really good. Um, but, yeah. what, but what was your GPA? So your first GPA was 2.5 in your undergraduate. So what was your, yeah. do, do you remember your GPA? With um, your first master's? Well, my GPA was 3.2. Oh, that's not bad. Yeah, 3.2. So it went up. Yeah, it went up. Mm. Yeah. That's good, um, considering. Uh, <clears throat> considering, um, you know, you, you went, uh, we can backtrack again. Um, I mean, you had some difficulties when you were getting your ma your first master's. You had a fire in your apartment. Yeah, I had a fire in mm -hmm. my apartment. You, you know, lost almost that. You lost almost everything. Yeah, I lost almost everything. But you know, that day I happened to be. I actually happened to be in church that day, so I was lucky. I didn't lose my life. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, yeah. Yeah, and. and um, how long ago has your mom been going now? Your mom has been going three years? Um, um, my mother passed away in 2014, so it's been six years now. Uh, wow. Yeah. So, it's you, been, you've been, it's you've been, been doing, you've been doing extremely well, despite everything. Um, despite your challenges. So, what type of reporting are you doing for the Harlem Times? Um, think, well, the Harlem Times slogan is news for the Harlem and the Harlems of the world. So, you know, we're doing basically reporting that mainly targeted toward an African-American reading audience. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, you know, I've done some reporting 
on a couple of reports on, you know, you know, some HBCUs and um, sci- and uh, science, technology, and engineering and mathematics. Mm. Um, I, I also done some. I also done a report on the bankruptcy of Johnson Publishing, which formerly um, published mm-hmm. Ebony and Jet magazine. Um, I've done reporting. So on Zona, Ebony and Jet magazine is no longer in publication. Correct. Well, um, well, um, they're, well, they're owned by the uh, rights to the um, the rights to the magazines are now owned by a company in Texas. I do so believe. Mm-hmm. And um, you know, um, I think they're still published. I think Jet is still published online. If I remember correctly, mm-hmm. so you know, I mean your your story that you did, um, the report that you did on the rocketry program was pretty, uh, with the NASA rocketry uh, program that was pretty decent. Yes, uh, yes, Morgan State University, which is based out of um, Baltimore, got a grant for uh, a rocketry a grant to start a rocketry program in their, um, at their university. Mm. And uh, let me see if I can pull that. Um, uh, 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 while you're doing that, Arlene, did you want to ask any questions? My question is, um, how do you um, find your facts out about these, these things about, these, uh, about African-Americans, about what, what they do, you know? How, yeah, how do you how do you find out your reporting or, or your statistics? Your facts, you know. Well, um, I go to reputable sources. I go to reputable sources like um, Washington Post and uh, NBC News, and um, you know, basically, you know, you know, you're not. You're, the thing is, you're not trying to plagiarize what they're saying. Okay, that, that's not. You know, that's not good. But they're trying to, I read the articles from the reputable sources and then I try to put my own spin on it, basically. Mm-hmm. That's, what I, that's, what I'm, that's what I'm That's what I'm. Do you, trying. as far as media and people with special needs are concerned, do you think um, media has uh, spun out of control lately since coronavirus or, or, or was it always spinning out of control? Well, the media, well, the media, the media, well, I'll put it this way. The media has always had its issues, um, you know, the media has had its issues before coronavirus, now have their issues after coronavirus has um, gone, you know, but, um, you know, as far as people with disabilities go, you know, you don't see that many you know, I, as far as I can tell, anyway, you, you're not seeing that many people with disabilities um, um, on the air, per se. I, rem- I do remember uh, a reporter who used to work at WWOR TV in New York City. His name was Chris O'Donnell. Yeah, I, I, I know him. I know him personally. I had a, I had an, I had a. Uh, 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 a running with him because he did a story on me and I did a story on him. Yep, <laughs> yep. I remember those. I remember meeting him. Yeah, he was in a wheelchair. But I forgot what 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 it was. What it he was. had a, okay. okay. Yeah, he had a soccer accident, and uh, you know, because um, he was into playing soccer. You know, being yeah. being from the country he's from, so. Um, uh, you know, originally from, so uh, that that's what caused him to be in the wheelchair. That and um, you know, yeah. pinch, uh, pinch nerves and, and and all of that stuff he was dealing with. So yeah, um, how I got to meet him um, back back when we were doing New Sixty Seven. Um, you know, it was myself, Roderick, and somebody else. We were following Chris around for the day and, and his <clears throat> and his reporting. 
and then he turned the tables on me at WWOR in, in the new in their newsroom, and he did a story on me. So, <laughs> yeah, I remember. Um, yeah. But it, yeah, there's John Hockenberry, there's Chris O'Donoghue, and then there's a couple of other people that are in, uh, that are um, special needs as well or disabled or yes. di or differently abled as um, you know. Can you give advice to anybody who is dealing with mental illness or mental challenges and wants to go into journalism? Well, um, the advice I would give them, you know, first and foremost, if they want to get into journalism, you know, make sure you know how to write. That's the that's the uh, that's the uh, the first thing that um, I would I would tell them, you know, basically. Mm -hmm. um, I remember when I first started at Bronx, and before I told anybody that I even had a disability. All right. Mm -hmm. um, the first, the first question that was asked by one of the senior interns at the time was, you know, Williams, do you know how to write? And I said, yeah. I mean, I, I think at that time I had taken like, you know, three different writing classes, one each intensifying in difficulty, and I passed each and every one of them. Mm -hmm. So, you know, so with um, high grade. So one thing I definitely know how to do is write, and I that would be the that would be the um, the very first thing I would tell them um, to tell them. That would, would be the first piece of advice that I would give to them. You know, definitely know how to write, and um, you know, definitely don't let your um, being differently able to stop you from um, achieving your dreams, all right? If you want to be on air, you know, you definitely have to work hard at it, but don't, don't let um, things, um, don't let the uh, difficulty of things um, scare you, basically. Mm -hmm. That's true, yeah. So, I agree. So no, what is... Like if you want to take something, go, go for it. Don't let it, you know, hold you up. Yeah. So, so William, what made you want to get two masters? You already have one. Well, um, well, um, you know what made me get my uh, second masters is um, I've always, you know, I was flirting with the idea of getting a degree, you know, with getting another degree. Um, I just so happened to find a a um, degree program in creative nonfiction writing at uh, Bay Path University, which is, like we discussed, is a, it's mainly a women's college in um, Long Meadow, Massachusetts. But they do offer um, graduate, pro or graduate programs for both men and women. Okay, so I want to make that clear. Okay. Mm -hmm. um, um, what made me want to get my second master's degree is, you know, I was doing some grant writing, okay? And I did it for two different organizations. The first one was called Career Resources, which helps people, you know, get jobs in Bridgeport, Connecticut, okay? And the second um, grant writing position was with the Beth L Center, which um, is a homeless shelter in Milford, Connecticut, mm -hmm. all right? And both people agreed. Both pe the people I worked with at um, both Career Resources and Death Health Center agreed that I was a good writer. And, and you know, everybody says that I'm a good writer. You know, basically. So basically, you know, we had at the end of the first grant writing, um, you know, the grant writing gig that you know they suggested that I, you know, go take some. Um, go take some classes in creative writing. And, you know, that's what, um, you know, fueled the, um, you know, the decision to get a second degree. You know, um, I tried to find, actually I tried to find some individual classes, you know, that dealt 
solely with grant writing, but I was having difficulty finding that. Mm. So I decided, you know, let's go get another degree. You know, in you know, it's, like I said, the degree at Bay Path University is in uh, creative nonfiction writing. So you know, I'll be basically writing about basically writing, you know, nonfiction, which you know I've been doing anyway since um I was since I've been you know you know writing stuff journal writing journalistic articles. So you mm. know, it shouldn't be you know very difficult, you know, so you have that. So, um, Sweetie, you want to ask, Arlene, you want to ask any more questions? Uh, I don't have any right now. Okay. Um, uh, William, uh, what are the misconceptions around people with disabilities when they first meet them? Well, um, the misconceptions I think about people would be people, you know, with uh, people with special needs is, um, you know, you know, they, you know, um, there's a stigma basically, and I, I think you know about that, mm -hmm. and um, you know, you know that you know, you know that there must be something that is terribly wrong with them, you know, that they're, you know, that they're weird, they're odd, you know. You know that you know that they can't function in a general society setting. You know, mm -hmm. you know, you know what I mean. Yep. So, so you know, you you gotta. The thing is, you have to educate. You know, you have to educate people on um, you know, special needs issues, basically, mm -hmm. and uh, you know. You know, and I think, you know, if there's more effort put into educating people on people with special needs, there won't be such a stigma for a person who does have special needs to tell people, you know, you know, this is my situation. You know, I do have this uh, physical disability. I do have this mental disability, you know, and... Um, you know, um, you know, that I'm different from, you know, you know, somebody who's considered to be normal because I actually had a friend, you know, he was a professor at Sacred Heart. He's no longer there, by the way. And, um, he what? He said this, uh, huh? Okay, can you repeat that again? Okay, um, like I said, dude, I had a professor at Sacred Heart. He's no longer there, but he would say that you know that you know there's in so many words that there's no such thing as normal. All right, uh. everybody has their problems. So okay, you know, you know, you know, everybody has their problems. You know, I think and this and this is me speaking now. You know, you know, everybody has their problems. You know, it's just a question of admitting whether you have you know, a problem or not, basically. Mm-hmm, yeah. Okay. And, 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 um, well, in journalism, this is not a nine to, okay, right, here's another question. Journalism is not a nine to five job, you know that. Okay. Yes, it's not a nine to five job, you know, I, um, yeah, it's not a nine to five job. I remember, you know, in a, around 2016, 2017, I got called um, by my publisher at the Harlem Times to uh, to interview somebody, you know, late at night. So, you know, you know, and the article had to be written, you know, after that. So, you know, I would say it was about 10:30, and now I was interviewing somebody. I think it was from a hotel in New York, you know, Westchester County. Mm -hmm. You know, so you know, um, you know, I was, you know, interviewing him about his hotel and stuff like that. And it, like I said, it was about ten thirty at night, and then the article was due after that. So, you know, if you're planning to get into the industry, know that you know there are different hours. Journalism news can happen at any time, basically. Pretty especially much. In the, in the television, especially if you're a TV journalist and, you know, you're, um, 
be asked to cover something late at night. Mm-hmm. You know? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I mean, you worked later than ten thirty, or or no? So far. Uh, I, have I worked later than ten thirty since? Not really, but you know, uh, but you know, most of most of the uh, most of my stuff is done during the day. But you know, like I said, I can't stress enough. Dudes can break at any dudes about anything can break at any time. Mm. And so well, any yeah. my, you know, so especially if you are, um, you know, differently abled, you have to be prepared for that. Well, yeah, um, and well, yeah, you, like, uh, cause I've, I've had experience working in newsrooms too. It's not nine to yeah. five. <laughs> it, it definitely isn't. Um, anything else you want to say before we end? We got about four minutes. The second college degree that I'm, I'm going for is a creative nonfiction degree. Uh, I was accepted in about, um, I think it was about, um, you know, um, late April, early May, I think. I forget when. But, you know, um, you know, um, they really liked my, um, um, cause, you know, I had to, you know, basically, um, write, uh, you know, in addition to the application, because I was doing technical writing, like grant writing and doing journalism and stuff like that. They wanted to see a, um, a, a, a piece where, um, you know, that explained what the best day of my life was, mm-hmm. you know, and um, I wrote a um, piece, I wrote a piece which was about 1,200 words that said, yeah, you know, basically, you know, about the best day of my life, which became the best days of my life, which be ultimately became the best week of my life. When I was working at Sacred Heart, and I was working on um, Tobacco Burn. I think I told you about that, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so Tobacco Burn, you know, I'm going to try to explain this quickly because we're running out of time. It's a, it's a play, it's, 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 it's a movie, it's a period piece about slavery. All right, and I was an extra, and, um, and uh, I was an extra. I played one of the slaves. And, uh, you know, it was a fun time, you know. It was a fun time. I got to meet a lot of people. And, um, you know, I you know, I didn't want to end. Mm-hmm. You know, I was up there for a week in South Windsor. And, um, you know, um, you know, you know, so that's why I wrote the piece about it. I think that's what put me over the top to be accepted. Um, as far as, well, all right. Um, as far as getting things done, and yeah. um, this is, um, 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 here's here's one more question or a combo. As far as getting things done and uh, being effective, journalism is not a nine to five job. And deadlines, how how has that worked with you? Have you gotten? I mean, despite your challenges, have you? like gotten your work done or have you had problems getting your work done or like what's some advice you can give to people who need to meet deadlines, especially in the journalism industry? Um, the, the job, the, the advice I would give them is, you know, try to get it done. Try to get things done as soon as if you know, you know that you are working a bit slower than everybody else. Um, you know, try to get it, Try to get it done immediately, basically. Mm-hmm. And uh, and um, you know um, you know um, and don't be afraid to ask for help. Yeah, don't be afraid to ask for help. If you need help, you know, doing some things, you know, don't be afraid to reach out. Mm-hmm. All right, because if you don't, you know, because um, like one uh, like one friend told me, you know, if you don't ask, the answer is always no. True. True. Well, I would like to thank you for joining us on this edition of Able to Learn Air. Uh, we would like to thank our sponsors, Washington County Mental Health, Green Mountain Support Services, uh, and uh, many, 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 many other sponsors. 
Uh, we would also like to thank our guest today, uh, William C. Jackson, freelance reporter for the Harlem Times, uh, um, who's all who's uh, who's all the way out to Connecticut, uh, braving the coronavirus. Um, and uh, thank you so much, William. Um, this puts an end to this edition of Able to On Air. I'm Lauren Seiler, and Arlene's here. Um, I'm Arlene Seiler. <laughs> we will see you next time on the next edition of Able to On Air. See you next time. Major sponsors for Ableton On Air include Green Mountain Support Services of Vermont, Washington County Mental Health, Ale Israel. Food sponsors for Ableton On Air include Geffen Foods Israel, Osem Foods Israel. Major media sponsors for Ableton On Air include Parkchester Times, Muslim Community Report, www.thisisthebronx.info, Associated Press Media Editors, U.S. Press Corps, Domestic and International. <laughs>